Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Krav Life. Uh, I'm Paul Simos, and I've got a special guest today, Mr. Dennis Fritzinger. Uh, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing good. Awesome. So can you uh, tell our audience a little bit about uh, where you are and uh, where you're located and all that stuff? Sure. I am um, in the Poconos of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and I'm located in two uh, areas where we teach out of. We teach out of the Poconos in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and we also teach out of Lehighton, Pennsylvania. Perfect. All right. So I want to start off with um, a little bit of uh, your background and um, and how you got started. So uh, did you start in Krav Maga or did you start in um, some sort of other martial art first? I, I started in other martial arts first. I, I was actually in the Korean martial arts for m many years before I, I uh, switched over to Krav Maga. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I started learning uh, Taekwondo when I was 13 years old and uh, continued taking um, Taekwondo and Tung Sudo. Um, I want to say, God, probably around, around 15 years I was taking it before I switched over to Krav Maga. Oh, wow. And how did you get introduced to Krav Maga? I was actually introduced by uh, a friend of mine. Um, his name was Frank Fuller. Um, he, uh, there was a seminar in uh, Philadelphia, and I had, I had gone to the seminar, and I fell in love with it. Um, it's definitely, definitely different than most other martial arts. Um, I, I, from having a Korean background, I really did not have um, a lot of self-defense against weapons. Um, it's very minimal in, in the Korean martial arts. And when I started, the, when I went to my first Krav Maga seminar, I was like, I was blown away basically by it. I was, I was to the point, I thought to myself, I don't know anything. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's how I got started into it. Oh, nice. Uh, what seminar, like who was teaching the seminar? Do you remember? Yes. Um, it was Randy Cash. Okay. He was the first seminar I went to. And then um, I tried to become um, ranked in a student through him, but he wasn't doing any ranking at that time. So I, uh, I actually ended up um, becoming a student of Moshi Katz. He was right. my first instructor that I was with. I was with Moshi for five years. Okay. Oh, nice. And um, now did that whole time, did you have your own studio or uh, was the studio after you? Uh, you no, did I, I, at that point in time, I was teaching out of Allentown. Uh, I was teaching quite Taekwondo out of uh, Allentown in Pennsylvania. Okay. And then uh, was it like you sold or shut down that studio and then opened up a crowd studio? Is that kind of how it happened? Yes, basically, yes. That's how it happened. I, right. I moved up to the Poconos um, from the Allentown area. We moved up to the Poconos and I, uh, I started teaching up in the Poconos around 2009. I believe it was around May of 2009 and uh, been basically teaching in the Poconos up and down the East Coast a little bit since 2009. Okay, so you've been in it a, a little bit more than a decade, right? 12 years. Um, and so who, so you said you, you were with Moshi Cats for um, five years, you said, and are you still affiliated there or have have you gone on to a, a different organization, different affiliation? Yes, yeah, so I'm currently uh, with uh, the Bukan School of uh, Original Krav Maga. Um, mm -hmm. My instructor now is uh, Luciano Di Genova. He's out of uh, Italy and um, he basically uh, 
all our teachings uh, come from um, the original uh, Amy Lichtenfeld's original techniques. Um, Yaron Lichtenstein's the the head uh, instructor. He's the one that owns and and operates the uh, the school. Okay. And um, so you're so do you uh, manage to get out to a lot of different. Uh, um, training sessions and uh, do a lot of travel because you mentioned going up and down the East coast. I, I do. Yes. Uh, actually, matter of fact, I will, I will be training um, in August uh, in a uh, sugar run. It's called, there's going to be a total of uh, 18 instructors. Um, some coming over from Israel and, um, but there's going to be a total of 18 instructors there. It's about a 25-hour course that'll be going on in uh, in August. Okay, and can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. It's uh, it, the event starts on on a Friday. It's about a 10, 10, 10 and a half hour day. Um, they're going to have active shooting from from Israel. It's uh has some Brazilian jiu-jitsu, uh, Krav Maga also in it, um, grappling. So it's a, it's a nice little event. It'll be my first time there, but it, it seems like it's going to be a decent event from uh, uh, talking to the people that hold it. Okay. Is that Krav Camp? Uh, uh, I believe so, no. yes. Oh, that, that's Ernie, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ernie's a great guy. You'll have a fun time. Um, yeah, those are those are great people. Um, so your studios, right? And and so take me like what is your kind of um, philosophy on on teaching? Like uh, like what are some of the things areas that you focus on with with uh, with students, especially new ones? Like how do you introduce them to uh, to Krav Maga? Well, I, I basically I introduced them basically the same way I was introduced to crab through Moshi Cats is um, there's really no holding back. It doesn't matter if you're a beginner or you're advanced. Um, my philosophy is on this is I'm going to teach you as if it's your first and only time that you're going to take Krav Maga. So I want you to get the most out of your training that you're going to get in the least amount of time that you may be with me. Um, because you, as M Moshi used to put it, you never know when you're going to walk out onto the street and be attacked by somebody. So you got to be prepared no matter if you're a beginner or if you're advanced. So we, I basically do not hold, um, any title with that regards if you're a beginner you're going to learn the same stuff as a, somebody that has advanced as if you're advanced you're going to learn the same things as the beginner hmm, nice um so you're all kravis have like their own specific type of teaching style um is yours influenced uh, from your, your days in, in Taekwondo or was it something that you had to kind of, you know, completely leave that uh, the Taekwondo stuff behind and, and completely embrace a new style of teaching with Krav Maga? I had to, I had to completely uh, leave the Taekwondo behind and, and um, just focus strictly on the Krav Maga. So, a lot of everything comes straight from Krav Maga. Now, the, the nice thing about being in um, the affiliation that I'm with right now, the organization, is I'm able to use uh, things that I have learned in Krav Maga from previous instructors. There's nothing uh, there's n nothing stopping me or uh, from being able to teach um, the Krav Maga techniques that I have learned throughout um, the 16 years that I've been taking it and that I have been uh, teaching also. Nice. So did you find that difficult? Like, uh, cause you know, 
like I, I come from a karate background and I did the same thing. I left, had to leave it all behind to embrace mm -hmm. um, the way Krav Maga does. But there's a lot, especially the number of year, depending on how long you've taken it, you, you build up some pretty bad habits, right? Uh, did yeah. you find it difficult to, in, at some points with certain things to overcome those bad habits? In the beginning, yes, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. I actually built my first, uh, my first Dan test, <coughs> excuse me. Um, my footwork was the hardest thing that I, I had problems with because um, learning uh, learning one style crab a uh, crab what I've learned from um, being in it for so many years and and going to different events and everything like that is is the techniques are always similar but the the ending may be a little bit different but um, when I first started taking it everything was about bursting. And, and moving forward. And then when I, uh, when I was getting um, ranked and with uh, Moshi, it was all about footwork with him. And I was having a hard time getting my footwork down. So I ended up filming my first Dan test with him. And it took me for my second try before I was able to get my um, pass it and get my instructor's uh, cert certificate so I could start teaching. And, but I was, I was with Moshi for quite some time before I actually uh, was able to pass. Does that, so having gone through that struggle, does it make it easier when you're teaching to kind of empathize with the student and guide them through any problems that they might have? Yes. It, it, what I try to, um, to describe with them and, and teach them is all about what their natural instincts are. And um, sometimes we have to modify the technique a little bit to um, make it adapt to the specific person. Um, but most of all, from basically what I was taught is, is it's obviously it's not karate. And so with this, it, it's about survival and we teach that it has to work um, out on the street. So if the technique's not working or does not work right away, it turns into basically into a fight and you have to be able to survive that fight. So it, it, a lot of it deals with aggression and um, natural instinct. Mm. So, and, and do you, um, like, how do you prepare your student for, for the uh, possibility that uh, what their, their self-defense may not work or what they're doing may not work? Basically, as we tell them, as they're running through the technique, uh, we like to switch students up constantly so that they're not working with the same student. Um, so what we like to do is just we tell them that as the technique, if it's not working at that particular particular time with them is to keep moving, keep moving forward, staying aggressive, aggressive. And uh, in the end, it's about survival. So you just, you have to keep, you have to keep at it. And, mm -hmm. and it's not always about the technique. So do you have any special drills that you use uh, to help people learn that aggression because for some people it's not natural right and and they don't want to hit someone or they have uh trouble yeah. being aggressive how do you get them over that hump well in the beginning um it, it's basically having them again like you said that a lot of people that they don't like to hit somebody so it's basically getting that person over that fear of hitting someone so uh, it, it starts off with training we keep telling them you know it's okay to hit a little bit and you know and we keep telling them to hit even more um the main thing that we like to use that i call we call it a survival night um it, it's basically it has somebody in the middle of the class and then they go against uh, a variety of different attackers and what that does is it, it helps bring out almost like a straight oriented situation, real life situation. And it helps 
them to open up a little bit and become a little more aggressive. And it also lets them see where they're at within their training. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah. So, so those, those type of drills def definitely, uh, definitely uh, help, help people to, to move past and, and to learn uh, to be more aggressive um, is because I know because um, coming out of COVID, right. Um, a lot of areas of the, of the country are um, like, there's definitely been an upswing in, um, in, kind of violence, shall we say, All right? Yeah. Um, and I think Philadelphia is definitely uh, one of those areas, right? Um, are you finding that in, in your area? And is it something that you address in class, like asking your students to be more vigilant? Actually, I, I, I got to say, I'm a little blessed with that, that we are not in a, in, that we don't live in an aggressive city. Um, now, we are close to, like, our area, I want to say we're probably closer to Scranton, and it, Scranton's a, a very big city, um, mm -hmm. but within CRAV, you're always trying to teach your, your students to be vigilant, be aware of their situations, um, always give yourself space. Um, and pay attention to your surroundings so that this way you have time to react if you need to. Right. So like so someone in your area, do they tend to have a more relaxed attitude um, when they're training because they live in a safe area uh, versus uh, someone that might be from a big city like Scranton? I'll be, I'll be honest with you. Most of my students are, are either, uh, ex-military or ex-law um, enforcement or they're beginning law enforcement. So most of them are training aggressively to, because of their backgrounds or what they're trying to do education-wise or, mm -hmm. or job-wise. So that seems to be like uh, your main market is the, uh, is the military or ex-military and uh, law enforcement uh, people? Yes. Yeah. And uh, do you have like um, like extra special courses for them as well, like to dealing with handcuffing and stuff, or is that something you deal with in your regular class? That's something that we usually do within our regular class. Okay. All right. Um, so with um, with the different. Um, trainings uh that you've done what what would be kind of like um your favorite part of uh of everything that you've learned like what's the the big um the big thing that you're like oh i loved it when so such and such a teacher was teaching this it really resonated with me i guess coming from the uh the korean martial arts i, I really want to say um dealing with the uh, knives and, and gun self-defense. That was really what brought my attention to Krav Maga. And that's really what I kind of, uh, I kept the trend going. I, I really like to hone in on those two areas. I, I figure I, what I like to tell my students is, is if you can defend yourself against uh, a, a knife attack, then you can definitely defend yourself against um, an unarmed attack. So we, I want to say we probably, most of our classes are usually 90% against some form of a weapon and, uh, versus dealing with, um, unarmed, uh, uh, attacks. Okay. So, so you have like, a uh, more of a focus on, on the weapons. Oh, uh, that's, yeah. uh, that's kind of cool, um, and is that's something that uh, that your students prefer it that way. Like they they like the dealing with the weapons. Yes. Yeah. And uh, do um, do you is there one weapon that you lean have more heavily towards? Is it the the knife or the or the gun? 
I want to say we usually deal with more of the knife than the gun. Okay. And why do you think, like, uh, why? <laughs> right. Um, I, being, uh, I, I taught in, um, for Laysaud Academy, um, back when I first started training in Crab Maga and, and became an instructor. And I had worked with a, a great gentleman. His name was Hal Gindro. He was a um, retired military police instructor and he was a, a retired uh, Philadelphia SWAT, SWAT right. instructor, police officer. And he was running his own business. And the one thing that I had learned over the years was is just when you're uh, when you're dealing with with a, a weapon as a, a knife that can be so dangerous and can become on top of you, uh, the person can be, become on top of you is uh, very quickly. That um, I just learned that that's probably the best weapon to actually learn self-defense against and i just really focused on that for, throughout the years of my my career that i've been doing this um they always say that a, a knife is more dangerous than a gun so mm -hmm. that's that's one of the reasons why we really hone in on on knife self-defense uh like i said we i I'm open twice a twice a week, and I want to say, out of those two nights out of the week, and I'm open roughly about two and a half hours the one night and two hours another night, and strictly we're probably about a good hour and a half to two hours of that night we may uh, do just situational knife attacks. Uh -huh. And so when you're when you're teaching. Um, teaching the knife is it more scenario based? Is that is that how you're you're teaching? It comes off of, some of it's scenario based, and some's just uh, um, regular routine self defense techniques that that we have uh, that I have learned over the years. Okay. All right. Um, so if someone is looking for a uh, a Krav Maga studio, what sort of um, tips would you give them to make sure that they end up at a good studio? Because as, as you know, not uh, to borrow uh, David Kahn saying, uh, not all Krav Maga is created equal, right? So not all studios are, are created equal. Uh, there's a lot of people that, you know, we could uh, argue that they're not real Krav Maga, but uh, what would your tips be for um, for someone trying to choose a studio for, for themselves so that they end up at a good quality one? Well, tip wise, what I want to say is, is that it really, um, with all the videos and everything that you have out there online these days, um, if you're following certain, um, certain instructors or, and you're watching certain, certain videos, Sometimes you can get a good um, a good look at the way how a, uh, an instructor is, and and you can determine that way. Another way that you can find out how uh, well a school may be is you can f um, check into their backgrounds to see if it's a a, a good legitimate um, school. Um, sometimes I don't always say that an organization is. A way to go, but I think you can find out a lot about an instructor depending on an organization and where they're coming from. Um, again, every every organization is different, so you can have one organization that says that they're better than another organization. So um, I don't necessarily go by that. Uh, my hardest thing was is I think when I first started doing this. Um, years ago, this is obviously um, when you're dealing with instructors that come from Israel, you're not always going to see that instructor. So a lot of your training sometimes comes um, not in person. So 
the way how I, I learned was just um, it, it kind of if you're dealing with an, uh, an instructor that's running through videos sometimes that are fast. Now, this is where I, I do. I try to do my movements slow so that this way people can pick up the uh, little intricate parts of the uh, self-defense technique. But if you're running through a technique fast, sometimes it's hard to see what the person is doing. Um, so you got to constantly keep going through maybe a, a, a video that you're you're watching from your instructor, we'll say. So that makes it makes it a little hard to do. But <clears throat> my biggest thing is this uh, it, it, again, and with the way how the world is today with technology. I mean, look at us. We're talking to each other. Uh, on the phone ourselves, you know, video chatting. But it, again, if you're gonna, if you follow someone, um, it doesn't necessarily matter what organization they come from. It just matters on if their techniques are are good and sound. Mm -hmm. And that's where you want to learn. It, you you want to learn from that person as long as they have good and sound techniques. Right. Okay. Um. So that's that's some good advice. Um, are are you um, do you yourself um, are are you available for uh, to conduct seminars and like do you do you do that stuff as well? Yes. <clears throat> okay. And if someone wanted to get in contact you uh, with you, right? Uh, how would they do that? What's the best Somebody way? Want if somebody wanted to come in contact with me, they could reach me through my website. They could reach me through um, Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a lot of people that, that usually uh, try to contact me through there. Uh, I'm on Google, so I show up under there. I have like a Google website, so they can contact me through that way also. Okay. Perfect, and we'll and we'll so. yeah, and we'll we'll list you on our directory as well, um, okay. on our Krav Maga directory. Um, so I want to I want to thank you for uh, taking a little bit of time out of your uh, evening to uh, to talk with me, and uh, hopefully uh, as restrictions lift all around the country, we can actually end up at the same uh, same training at some point and uh, and meet in real life. That would be nice. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. All right. Well, you uh, you have yourself a good day, and uh, we'll talk to you uh, talk to you later. Thanks for being on Krav Life. All right. Thank you for having me.